Okay, everyone, we are going to go ahead and get started this evening. And um, I just want to make sure we are, does it, I think, yeah, it's recording. So my name is Carrie Davis, and I am a sales coordinator who lives currently in Mesa, Arizona, and it's from the Oregon region. And I was actually first introduced to Juice Plus in 2010 by a chiropractor. And I was pretty desperate at the time, I have to say. Um, I had been a single mom for a lot of years, and I was in the gym four or five days a week, just continued in my 40s and 50s to gain a lot of weight. Nothing was working. Diets weren't working. And um, I eventually was put on four different medications, and I um, nothing worked. It wasn't getting better, and it wasn't getting, uh, it, it was just wasn't getting worse. It, nothing. It was just like nothing was happening, and I just knew that there had to be a better way. And so when he first introduced me to flooding my body with these plant-based nutrients and drinking two shakes a day and making some lifestyle changes, it just totally made sense to me. And I jumped in with both feet. And in the next about eight months, I was able to get to a healthier weight, which for me, that was about 80 pounds lighter. And the best part is that I was off all my medications. I got my energy back and it just, it was incredible. It was like this gift that was given to me. And so I kind of went along for a little while and I was real intrigued with kind of a plan B. I wasn't real happy with my job. I hit the income ceiling. I was not happy with the fact that I was giving up a lot of time um, and was missing time with my kids. And so I began to look at the company behind this product and I decided to, again, once again, jump in with both feet and uh, never looked back. And when I went to my first conference, um, I actually, that's when they launched the Tower Gardens. And I hope if you guys cannot hear me, please let me know in the chat. Um, but when I saw the Tower Gardens at the time, I was taking in uh, kids that were homeless and through foster care. And all of the kids come in from very nutritional deficient environments. And so they're put on a lot of medications. And a lot of those kids are on medications from five to 15 different medications. And I just felt like when I saw the Tower Garden, I just thought we were going to change the planet. And I just knew that if I could grow more fresh fruits and vegetables and flood these kids' uh, bodies with fresh food, that it was going to make a difference in a really big way. And it did. It was profound what the changes that happened with these kids. And so um, when they first launched it, there was also kind of another movement going on, and that was teachers. Teachers were really seeing this as a tool, an interactive tool, to help the kids learn more about um, their environment, about how to grow, and doing it in a really um, interactive and tech, uh, just the technology that was behind the tower gardens. And they just saw that as a way to reach these children. And we know that if we, um, if children are uh, able to see things grow and they're able to eat it, that they do more of that. So it was really a great, it was a great win-win uh, for everybody. And so if, if you go um, on to, let me see if I can get this to go. Oh, there we go. Um, if you go just Google Tower Gardens and schools, you're going to find thousands of pictures of uh, Tower Gardens in a school setting. And it's really an, it's an incredible uh, way to really um, get synced in with what's happening around the nation. Um, our teachers are really our innovative leaders. They're the ones that uh, can see the a student engagement with these tower gardens and having this interactive experience. And it just is, it's an incredible classroom tool. And so, um, so I would challenge you to go out and start looking about that. We have about 5,000 towers in classrooms right now. I mean, that's amazing to me. And it's continuing to grow. I mean, it's not slowing down. It's only going to get bigger. So in Southern Oregon, I have towers at two schools. Well, Actually, no, we have them at about four schools now. And I have them at restaurants, I have them at spas, I have them at uh, retirement homes. And so that's what we're gonna kind of get into the nuts and bolts this evening um, and talk about, you know, how, what does this look like and how can you prepare when you're looking at going into a classroom? Um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is a memory jogger. It's really important for you to really stop and think about all your connections that you have in the school. And if you um, start writing those names down of the, your kids' teachers, uh, people that you know that are classified employees, that are you know, janitors or secretaries or their teacher's aides, 
um, people that you know that are on school boards that are involved in the PTO, you're going to get a pretty big memory jack. And that's going to be kind of your launching pad into getting these connections because it's going to be really important to have a lead person. And when we're looking at schools, we want to keep in mind that there's more schools than just public schools. And that is going to kind of expand with the foundations that you're going to be looking at because some foundations do not want to fund public schools. They want to go into charter schools or magnet schools. So really start looking at the kinds of schools that are in your area. So anywhere from private schools, Christian schools, magnet schools, charter schools, um, all the way from preschool, Head Start kind of school settings, all the way up to universities because the curriculum that we have will serve all of those, um, those demographics. So it's really important to kind of make a list. I actually made a full list of all the schools and then next to them I would write if I had a lead or a connection there um, and I would write next to it who it was. So it's really important for you to kind of link those two together. Um, so prior to the presentation, you're going to need to kind of um, figure out who your key people are because that person is going to be what we call a lead person. It's the person that you're going to go to to talk to them, to get them interested, be curious about the tower gardens. And they're the link between you and the principal and the school board. And sometimes these meetings, well, definitely any meeting that you have at a school is going to involve the principal. It's not, it's just not going to happen if you have it just with the teacher. So really involve your principal or your vice principal, whoever's going to be there. And sometimes it could involve your school board and doing a school board presentation. And if you go to your virtual office, there's a presentations under uh, resources. They're already done for you. Like, and I would shorten them up if it were me, because I think, one of the things that is a problem with both restaurants and schools is everyone is so busy. They're, you know, when they had the no child left behind, that changed the way our teachers teach and how much time they have. And so it's really important that you honor their time. So prior to the presentation, um, you're going to have to find out how much time they have. And it could be 15 minutes, and that's actually okay. 15 minutes is a good presentation. Um, so really check with them on what that might look like for them. Some of the questions that I ask before I go in is like, what is their vision? What are their needs? Um, are they thinking about growing outside? Are they thinking about growing inside? Um, did they think about one tower? Did they think about 12 towers? Like it's really important to open that up for them so they can kind of visualize what this might look like. Um, the other thing that's going to be really important is how many towers are they looking at? Like they might have only thought one, but when they get to start visualizing, it might grow to three, six, 12. And it depends on whether they're all going to be in the same area or do they want them in separate classrooms. So th that logistics is really important for you because that's going to help you with your presentation. There's several things that can happen at a school. There's what I call a microeconomy, which is a garden to groceries project like the Boys and Girls Club. So that's where the kids actually grow it. They create something like hummus or salsa or whatever. They take it to a farmer's market, they sell it. And so it's like this whole microeconomy. And that is an incredible project. They do need to have a commercial kitchen to do that. But I have one school in Southern Oregon that actually does that. The other one is just to be able to provide the curriculum um, for the teachers and uh, making sure that they know how to get in there and how to use it and that it's free to them. And then really identifying what they're going to do with the produce because we all know like tower gardens just grow and they keep growing and they keep growing. And what are they going to do with the produce? And that could look like um, they're going to make lunches for the kids or maybe the cafeteria is going to use it or maybe. Um, they're going to send produce home to the family. I mean, there's so many things that can happen, but really talk to them about it because they're going to want to harvest and uh, continue to harvest as the school year uh, progresses. And I have to say, 
I love growing inside, but these tower gardens, when they're outside, they're incredible. Um, and so really honing in on that because I've had teachers say, well, I'm going to grow tomatoes inside and I have to spend the time to, to talk to them about, okay, that's fine, but you're going to have to self-pollinate. You're going to have to learn how to pollinate these plants, which could be a great experience for the kids, but there are no bees inside. So you're going to have to figure this one out because they're going to grow better outside um, if you can. So really kind of drilling down into what they're going to do with the produce, what do they want to grow, and then um, making sure that the teachers on board know about the curriculum and uh, where to get it and how to access it and how they can kind of morph it and change it to what they need. And then really discuss um, ideas about the tower garden during the summer because they're usually off during the summer. So I have one school that actually did a private or a silent auction. They auctioned off the tower garden to a parent to take care of in the summer, the tower garden. So it's kind of like the hamster goes home, well the tower garden went home. And so they made money on that silent auction and this parent got an experience that is going to turn into, um, you know, a customer, a tower garden customer. And so that's why it's really important to stay in touch with the, the uh, schools as you're going along. You're going to have to look at their facilities, like where's their power, where's their water source, um, how easy is, is it for the teachers to get in and out with that. Like I just set up six of them at a school in Southern Oregon and I was setting them all up and found out last minute due to construction, one of their classrooms was like three blocks away. So we had, so that was a logistic uh, problem. So it's really important to make sure that you know kind of what's going on at their facilities and where the access to power and water is gonna be. And then I did a little training. I always do a training with the teachers and that lead person is so important. It's kind of that role of support so that they connect with you and you don't have all these teachers calling you or emailing you um, and they can kind of funnel into that lead that lead person and that lead person's got to be able to take that on and then making sure that you're sending them the links so there's links uh, YouTube videos on you know like how to harvest how to put things together how to check their pH I think it's really important that we give them as many tools as possible to make it easy for them because if they get frustrated they will not do it they just won't, they don't have the time. So really important to get your teachers prepared properly. So here is, the, um, here is some of the, the curriculum. And I just love this because like this one, um, it, it can be actually changed. It's for sixth and seventh graders, but I actually have kind of changed it, uh, you know, uh, modified it to where high schoolers, uh, ninth, 10th graders can use it. And what's really nice is that uh, they partnered with, um, the company did with the Buck Institute of Education in this kind of project-based learning module. And teachers are all about project-based learning because hands-on learning is the way to do it. So I'm really excited that our company um, invested and did this because this is incredible. Um, so the next one is we have uh, some worksheets and slides for grades two and up, five and up, and seven and up. And it's, it's kind of a STEM project. And you, if you get into the schools, they're going to talk a lot about STEM. But it really has to do with this hands-on project-based learning. And when they see that it comes out of Seton Hall, they're so excited. Oh, my gosh. They're, it's pretty incredible. And so um, then we also have it for kindergarten and first grade preschool. And this is really important because preschoolers, the teachers are really involved with the preschool kindergarten grades. So um, this is really important. There's like 20 different exercises um, that they can access. And I just think it's really, if we show them how to get to it and we show them how easy it is, it's going to be a win-win for them because they don't have to create anything. They just have to plant it, watch it, and keep it going, you know? So here's what we want to do it's in terms of resources um it's really important i'm going to show you the difference between national resources and local county and state foundations and 
I think it's important for you to reach back and see who you know. Like if you know anyone on a nonprofit board, I would be asking them who the who their liaison is for the foundations and see if you can make a connection. The reason I say that is I right now, I've known this guy for a long time. He's a Juice Plus customer, but he uh, sits on a board. It's his uncle's uh, foundation. And he, they actually, their focus is to um, empower young people. So outdoor projects, tower, he got so excited about the tower gardens. And anything to do that would help children become more resourceful and more independent. And he loves charter schools, although he just uh, funded uh, another school. And it was not a charter school, so it's starting to expand out. But literally because of my relationship with him, uh, I meet with him once a year. And he said, what schools do you know that want tower gardens? I want to fund them. And he has about a million dollars to give away. That's incredible. So really think about like, who do I know on a nonprofit board? Talk with them, tell them, I'm looking to partner and really get a connection with a foundation. Who's your liaison person? And how, you know, is there any way that we, I could get a meeting with them? Really start to court them. It's really important. So who do you know? And then the role of the lead person really needs to be so, um, so hammered out in terms of just have some guidelines for that lead person on how to contact you, when to contact you, where some of the resources are so that um, it makes it easier for them. PTOs can do a lot of fundraisers. Um, I've known a lot of PTOs that have, have done that. And so that's another great way to raise money for schools. I think the main thing that I'd like to say tonight is you are not the grant writer. You do not want to get into that role. Um, these grants are fairly easy to write. They're online. It doesn't take a whole lot. And the teachers or the lead person needs to have some skin in the game. They need to be able to do that and keep you out of it. Um, so that's, that's really important. And then the other thing is when they're writing the grant, I always talk to them about adding in additional accessories into the grant. So I always have them do like two or three years of tonic. Um, like, you know, extra pumps, because if they have a pump that goes out, they can just go to the closet, grab one. So getting some different accessories, if they're growing outside, maybe in the grant, they're um, putting in a greenhouse. Um, my um, garden to grocery school, they put in for a commercial refrigerator and a commercial food processor. So really, when you're starting to really think about what this school needs, it's kind of like, for me, it's like, go big or go home. Like, you really want to go big and really get people out of their mindset of like, well, I can just have a couple tower gardens and that'll be great. You really want to really expand what they're thinking. So it really becomes something beautiful. And then you need to have that discussion with them that they need to follow up with the foundation once the towers are in place. There's a media piece. They're, they need to um, get some pictures. Um, the foundations really want to know, like, how are you doing? What are the kids like? You know, being able to send them pictures or a little update. And some of the grants might even ask for that. So it's really important to know that you need to follow up with that. Um, okay, so um, sometimes there's a, there is in our uh, virtual office, uh, there are letters that go out that you can um, create and get them out in the classroom news. You can send them home with the parents, like we're getting tower gardens. You can really get the parents excited. Um, and you know, this is where uh, for Juice Plus representatives, um, when parents come in and they get excited, that's, those are leads. And so being able to have some information um, on uh, how to connect with you is really important. And having your lead person be able to give them that information is really important as well. Um, and so I wanna show you something, cause this is really important. These are some national grant resources. And um, these are typically people that, uh, foundations that typically give to um, tower gardens to go into schools. But you, so you see like there's, um, there's like six, right? So, but look at this, when it comes to your state, county, city um, foundations, look how much, how many more. So this is Oregon. Um, 
all of these foundations are local to Jackson County, Southern Oregon, Josephine County. Some of them are Central Oregon down. Um, all of these foundations have been known, are known for helping children. And there's nothing more that they like to do than to fund a project uh, that will impact kids. And so um, when you're going out to look at these foundations, they all have a, what we call an open window. Um, the foundation that I work with, is the open window is January through April. Uh, so you need to know when those, that open window is for applying. And that's when your teacher needs to go in and, and get this done and get the grant written. So I'd really encourage you, just Google, like just go out and Google foundations in the state of Ohio or, you know, foundations in whatever county you live in that, you know, so there is a plethora of uh, foundations out there that uh, people do not access. And they, and honestly, I have to tell you, after being in the nonprofit world for a while, uh, a, um, a uh, a grant of under six thousand or under ten thousand is um, okay. I'll get back to that question. I just got sidetracked a little second. Um, uh, being able to give them a list of foundations is really important, and so it's going to be different in every area that you live in. So I would just Google it and try to find some. And sometimes you can actually connect with one and they will give you information on other ones. And I will tell you that casinos are really big about donating and funding grants for kids. So like Cal Creek Foundation is in Oregon. It's a casino and it is very well known for giving grants to, to kids. So anyway, uh, for kids. So I hope that that helps. So really look at your local um, city, um, state, foundations and if nothing else go to the national ones but there's a bunch of them out there okay so um so once you are uh, you've gotten every the grant is in and it's been you know they're funding it there's usually a like a two-month window where you get notified that the that the grant request has been funded and depending on your school, like I had one school pay it all off with a credit card and that, and they totally did that. And so it's immediate, right? It's just like another order. Some schools do it by a purchase order. So they actually get the grant, they uh, do a purchase order. And then um, what happens is they, um, they submit it to the company, the company ships it and, um, and then they pay it. So, this is where that lead person really comes, uh, is really critical and important to have in place. So, so the company ships it out. So once the school receives the merchandise, they remit payment. And they'll also get a call from the company to just make sure that they've received everything, everything looks really good. And um, so it's really important to know that they will get, be getting a call from the company. So there is an actual form that is a school bundle um, I love the Science Lab bundles because they come with all the dollies, all the lights, all of that. It's just an incredible three towers. It's really a great bundle. But you might have a school that wants a community garden. Now, the community gardens are wonderful. They're 12 towers, but they can only be, they're only put together so that you can't separate those towers. So let's just say um, you have a school that wants 12 towers but they want them in different areas. That's gonna mean you're gonna to have to go out and do like four science lab bundles because the community garden is not gonna work. It has to be in one area where they have an irrigator. Um, when you have a farm and the, the community garden, they can actually make monthly payments or they can pay it off in full, which normally it's what they do. And when there's a farm, you actually have to contact the company and the distributor gets a 10% one-time referral fee. and if that tower uh, farm wants to become a distributor, then they place it under you and it's assigned to you as a team member. So it's a little bit different. You have to go to, um, let me think, farm support at towerfarms.com if it's a farm. So now you've got that all done. Now it's time to set them up. You really need a team of people to set up. So that could look like the teachers or the parents and the students all helping you. And I'm going to show you some pictures that are pretty cool. Um, it could mean that you just have a couple team members helping you out. 
but I think it's really important to have somebody there to help you because if you're putting together six or more towers, it's an all day job. I can just tell you that just, just from experience. And then you need to set up a time and this is the tough one. Teachers do not have all time together. So you have to be able to do training with your lead person or several people so they understand like how to set them up. I mean, we get them all set up, but then you know how to get the water, how to get your nutrients in there. So give them a little Tower Garden 101. And then making sure that they know how to access the curriculum and then give them the same kind of customer care that you'd, you would for your Juice Plus customers. That's really important. Okay, so here's Southern Oregon Schools, Valley Charter Schools. Um, and they had an outdoor greenhouse, but their kids and the adults helped set up the towers. It was fun. Oh my gosh, the kids had a good time. And then here's the Southern Oregon Kids Unlimited Academy. They have six, but they put them in all different classrooms. So you can kind of see like it can be, it can look like different, different things to the, each school. So now I'm going to kind of turn a little bit and go into restaurants. So it's all about the question. Okay, that's, it's so important. The size of the restaurant, like how many, how big is it? How many people uh, come through? Are they open just for dinner? Are they open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Um, do they have multiple locations? What produce do they use the most? Because I'm telling you that, that's huge. I have a restaurant in Southern Oregon that all they grow is lettuce because that's the most thing that they use and it's the quickest thing. It just, they, it's incredible. Um, so you have to find out what do they use the most and you have to really sit down with them because if they say, well, I use tomatoes the most, well, you might have to go to the second thing because tomatoes is a one-time thing. Um, you know, it's got a season and it's done, but, and it's not going to keep up with their pace. So really be looking at the greens, the herbs, the things that are going to harvest real quickly. And then look at their location. Again, it's all about logistics, power, water, where's it at? Um, uh, do they feel like it's safe to be outside? Um, I have some that I have one that uh, chains two of them to their uh, to the back wall just to make sure nobody rolls it down the street. Um, you know, and then again, the quantity of towers is three going to be okay? Is six better? I have a, a restaurant that has two of them at the restaurant and then four of them at home. They do most of the groin at home. And then who is going to be the caretaker? Now this is a big one. This is the the like golden nugget of restaurants. I had a tower garden service. So what I did is I charged $25 a week. I went and I took care of their tower. I checked the pH. I got their tonic right. I groomed their plants. I washed things off. It made it look really nice. And I did everything once a week. That was four times a month. That was $100 a month. Ideally, what you want to do is train somebody that's in-house, somebody that they can trust. And so if you train somebody, then the restaurant owner can actually um, give them that little bonus every month, which is kind of nice. That's really nice because that person then, again, is that lead is going to be doing the seedlings. They're going to be doing, taking care of it. And the restaurant owner, honestly, does not have time for this. They're in there early. They're cooking. They're not going to have time to mess around with towers. They just aren't. Um, unless they have somebody um, that's going to be helping them. So that's something to think about. Um, and so here's one. Uh, you can see, well, that we did a basil tower. Look at this guy. It was a basil um, extravaganza. And then uh, giant red mustard. Um, she loves to make wraps. And so she has two towers that are always giant red mustard. And then, of course, her lettuce. So um, this is really, um, you have to really find out what's going to work for them. And then there's Mustard Seed Cafe. Um, again, you can see the amount of lettuce. And um, lettuce is pretty expensive. Uh, so um, that's usually what people, and herbs, what people want to grow. Um, you know, if they say broccoli, I'm, I'm telling them don't grow broccoli. You know, you got one head, you're going to harvest it, and it's done. It's not, you know, you need something that's going to grow fast. So that's kind of what's going on there. So the other ones are retirement homes and spas same thing i have met retirement homes i have met adult foster homes i have met a spa anywhere that you can get this exposure i had cards out you know with my uh, information they called me like the tower garden consultant i would sign the restaurants up as uh, team members and then i would be the consultant almost like a wellness 
coordinator because then when they had people um, interested, they would just give them my information or call me with their information and then I was able to connect with them. So, um, so now we can go out and change our community. And I'm gonna actually um, answer some questions here and then I, I'm gonna stop sharing. Hold on a second, let me um, actually, let me uh, stop the recording. So thank you everyone for joining. I'm gonna stay on here for a second.